someone will hear. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
11th from 4 o'clock until 7 o'clock will be right here in Metro Hall. We would like for everybody to come out for that. The $5 that you pay for a ticket, if you're an adult, uh, is going to help. There's a lot of things that our children need to do about the year. Getting more and more kids on time, and we really want to be able to have strong ministries for both our youth and our children. So help us with that and enjoy some real good spaghetti in the process. The last thing I'm going to tell you about is Mother's Day and Father's Day pictures. And for a couple of years now, we have been uh, featuring on Mother's Day Sunday and Father's Day Sunday kind of a video of uh, men and father's day. Of course, women uh, for Mother's Day. So if you do not uh, get more yeah, true.
you greet one another with peace of the Lord. But make sure you look closely because you don't want to get the damn. saw the holes in his hands. 
Yeah, until he saw the holes in his hands. Now, you know what Jesus said? Blessed is the person. That is right, Bobby. He said, blessed is the person who believes well, have it out having to see the evidence without having to see the holes in his hands. Isn't that what he said, Javi? Isn't that what he said? Just say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what he said. So, you know what? Here's my word for you today. You are blessed if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. Unless you, without having to see evidence, because we can't see evidence, can we? Yeah, yeah. See, so where, how do you know Jesus is alive? Because he lives in where? He lives in your heart. He's in your life. And he's always with you, isn't he? Isn't he with you, Javi, all the time? Say, amen. Yeah, that's right. He's with us at all times. At all times and every place. He is with us. So let's pray, okay? And thank him for being with us. Dear Lord, thank you. For being alive and alive in my heart because I believe in you. You are my Lord and my Savior. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen. Okay, you can go to Sunday school or you can stay up here, but I appreciate you for helping me preach this week. Yeah. <laughs> we want to invite you to stand once more and
knowledge of his greatness and of the sufficiency in our lives and in people's lives. There is a slender insert that is provided for you that shares with you um, prayer concerns that we've been asked to pray for. And there's a more complete list that's made available for you of prayer concerns we received in this past week or over the last few weeks. It's available for you at the conclusion of the service. And those will be at the desk in the back, or you can pick them up in the knockback area if you'd like to as well. These are names I want to share with you this morning that we need to add to, to the ones that are printed. Currently, right now, this weekend, Jane Colby has become a patient hospital. Jan is in Northwest Hospital. And Suzanne Rush, you went into the hospital yesterday, and um, she's at Mercy Hospital. We want to be faithful and lift up Pat Mayer, who has had a battle with cancer, and has, her cancer has um, appeared again. And we can pray for her. Her outlook is great. For Marilyn Hurdle, who is head of our prayer ministry, and for concerns she health concerns in her life. We can be faithful and pray for sure. And some of the concerns she has related to her kids as well. Um, you see the others that are in the hospital, both um, Don Chudy has been in the hospital for several weeks, and we ask you to continue to pray for him and for his healing. He's still in critical care. Um, pray for his wife, Egg, and Claude Bradley, and Jack Hunter, and Emma Rose, Jenny, and Doll, and for all their needs, as well as everyone who's listed here in, in times of convalescing and those of you that you don't have to touch. You know that if you worship here regularly, that it is a gift and it's a privilege to us to be able to pray for the churches in this community. And so today we have an opportunity to pray for our sister congregation, Highlands United Methodist Church. It's on, that's in the Highlands. We want to be faithful and praying for the church family there, too. I invite you now to go for me for the Lord's Son of Sovereign God, we come before you, our God, who is great. In each of us, in our heart, we wish you greatness. In each of us has our own way of expressing it and acknowledging it. Because you are great. Father, in this world that we've lived in in this week, and we've seen tragedy, we've seen the result of evil. But even in all that we've seen that we completely do not understand or cannot fathom, you are a great God. So we intercede on behalf of persons that are grieving the loss of precious loved ones. We intercede on behalf of rescue personnel that have witnessed horrors. We intercede on behalf of families that are in need because they've lost in their life. They've lost loved ones. They've lost homes. They've lost financial stability. They've lost jobs. We pray for a family overseas that is confused about what has taken place in the United States in regard to their own son. We pray for those that have caused evil. Father, that a change of heart would take place. We pray, Lord, just the blanket covering of your powerful presence over lives so that your greatness will be seen, will be heard, will be felt, will be known. Father, may we not be like and doubt and require evidence from you. Physical. But may our evidence be in the feeling of your Holy Spirit. May our evidence be in the power of your spoken and written word. May our evidence be in the knowledge of your presence that dwells with Father, today we also pray for those on our prayer concern list, every name, every person in the hospital, every situation, every occurrence and reoccurrence of cancer, for those that are in need of help and making decisions in their life or have financial worries or relationship concerns, we pray for them today. And over all, may your greatness be known, may your greatness be felt, 
May your greatness be power and strength and help and hope and healing for lives. And may we all come to know you in a very real and personal way. Loving God, we thank you and we praise you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in you. And it is the loving, saving name of your Son, who is more than Savior in our life, that we pray. Together we say. Amen. Amen. I invite those that will be receiving off this morning to come forward. And we invite you to participate in the and feel that every minute that you follow that's place. What you give is a, is a representative of uh, the thanksgiving of God for all that He does, for all that He did with us. So if anyone listens, listens to Christian radio, you probably will recognize this next song. It's been number one for a while. And uh, it's kind of special to Shannon and I because uh, her little sister uh, wrote the chorus and co-wrote the whole song. And uh, we're happy to thank for you.
There's so many opportunities in this world to be in ministry. We're witness to that through music and song and video and the grace that God gives each of us. We've been walking through a sermon series here in the Sundays of Easter. It's, uh, yes, I misspelled Pentecost, but it sounds better that way. From the cross to the Pentecost. Jamie pointed that out a couple weeks ago, so I'll point out again if you weren't here. But anyway, the cross to Pentecost. And uh, some of the, the gospel readings, that, especially Luke and Acts, the, go from Easter to Pentecost. But we're reading out of John right now. John doesn't really separate the resurrection from Pentecost and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And last week's story is very similar to this story where Jesus comes to the disciples. And this isn't just simply... 12 or the 11 now after Judas' death, this is the, considered, if you read the commentaries, considered the body of believers. There may have been some of the 11 disciples and some of the others, but Jesus has come to them post-resurrection and has appeared. Last week he appeared and Thomas wasn't there. And this week Thomas will be there. Our scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. And this is the story starts, but Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, in our story last week. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, this is Thomas, he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And a week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them this time. And although the doors were shut, like last week, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. And do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, have you, believe, you have believed because what you have seen Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you might have life through Him. This is a story that, I don't know, it's a fairly common story, but more common than that is the title. We hear it as um, Doubting Thomas story, or the Doubting Thomas story. If you were greeted at this door by Tom Walton, he played Doubting Thomas in our Easter pre-Easter service where he was so proud to be Doubting Thomas. And that's nothing to be ashamed of because it's actually a, a great and wonderful story. People think, I don't want to doubt, but Tom was very proud. He was Doubting Tom, was Tom Walton, but anyway. <laughs> it was fun to see him be a disciple and take on that role. We listen to this story and we think there was someone who doubted. His name was Thomas. And he came to believe because he saw the evidence, evidence of Jesus' physical death. And now he was there. And that's the story, right? Or is it? This week, we came Monday afternoon to hear of a horrible story. We saw the pictures on television. We, I'm sure many of you didn't know what was going on. If you didn't, you found out very quickly, whether it was Facebook or someone texted you or you glanced at the news, but there were explosions at the Boston Marathon. The very first images I saw were of the first explosion right near the finish line at hour four of everybody racing. And there was evidence there that something had happened, right? A video evidence, photographic evidence, eyewitness accounts. There became more evidence of something horrible that happened when they said at least one or two or three people had died and many people injured. You could see on television the images of the blood. And then there was a second explosion that they discovered and they showed the video of it. You really couldn't tell. I remember thinking, I don't see where it is. But then they highlighted it on the screen. They drew the circle around it and you could see the second billow of smoke down the street. You knew something was really wrong. Me, I, I thought, well, what is it? Beginning, I thought, well, there is evidence that there is an explosion. Maybe it was a restaurant, something horrible happened, and it's not a bomb. But as the second explosion occurred, you begin to think, 
must be a bomb. Something horrible has happened. You, I know images for me became of September 11th, 9-11, and the uh, Oklahoma City bombing and other things that we've had, the car bombings and explosions we see around the world. No one wanted to say it. No one wanted to say that there's evidence of a, another terrorist attack, but obviously there was some kind of terror attack going on. The evidence for that truth, I felt very quickly, but no one wanted to say then the evidence of how bad it was came. The day after the explosion, people were showing me pictures I didn't want to see of, of people that had lost their limbs, legs blown off, and scars, and people had traumatized. Then the evidence mounted that it was something terrible, not an accident. The backpacks were shown and pressure cookers which were filled evidently with those things that were pulling from the wounded, ball bearings and BBs and nails whatever other metal objects they could find. The evidence became very clear that this was intentional, that it was thought out, that it was planned. It continued. Through the week, we saw pictures of people that were supposed to be involved, and then we found that that was not really good evidence, that there were people that were not involved. But then through many, many hours of people searching video and pictures, they found the images of two young men carrying backpacks that resembled those that were at the scene. They were identified together and then separately at the bombing sites. And it became clear that evidence was leading them to these two young men, one only 19. And we discovered who they were and we found out their names and there was a manhunt. And then it became very clear because they were shooting and blowing things up in the surf. In the midst of this, you hear the cries from their uncle. He had seen the evidence. He knew that his nephews probably had done something horrible. And here the evidence was pointing back at him as his family. And he literally cried out. They had, you know, disgraced our family. He cried out that the evidence is not against me and my family. I know it's my family, but please, we didn't do this. I didn't do this. Have mercy on them. And he prayed for them to turn themselves in. Then we saw the video of the father. We saw him in Russia pleading for his son to turn himself in after the brother had been killed. All he wanted was to have another son, to keep his son alive. And he didn't want to believe it. He was in disbelief that one of his children could do this. He wanted proof, I'm sure. He wanted absolute proof. I know I would. Things happen and we don't want to believe and we don't want to happen to our children. But the evidence is becoming more clear. Then, here at the end of the week, the youngest man was found, 19 years old, and bloody and bleeding, and hiding in a boat. And it was over. The city of Boston had done what they were asked to do. They had locked themselves in. And it was a ghost town. They had seen the evidence. They had heard the story. But when they found the second young man, he was in custody. It was over. They could relax. Life could go back to normal. And as the president said, we would run the race again. But is it really over? Why? Had they done what they had done? It's not over because we don't understand and we want to know why did they do what they did? What pain had they seen? What trouble in their lives caused this? What evidence had they seen that justified doing the act of hurting people, doing such an evil thing? What story had they been told? We found evidence that the older of the brothers was being troubled, that he said he didn't have any American friends. But the younger brother still, he seemed to have had friends and his life seemed to be going well. What would change? What would drive them so far to do such a horrible thing? What, tour, what story had they been told? Thomas had been told a story. 
He'd been told the story that Jesus was alive, that he was resurrected from the dead, and Thomas didn't believe it. He said, I will not believe until I see the scars on his hands and I touch his side. He'd been told a story that was too good to be true. He wanted evidence. He wanted physical evidence that it happened so that he could believe. And he was given that. The story tells us that Jesus presented himself to Thomas and said, Here is the evidence. Touch and believe. The end of the story, right? No, it's not the end of the story. Because Jesus says it's not the end of the story. And we often think that the story is about Thomas. But the story is not about Thomas. The story is about Jesus. The story is about Jesus presenting himself to those who don't believe. That those who are going from unbelief to believe. In verse 29 it says, and I'll read forward. Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these, these stories are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the story. As we read the scriptures again, Jesus tells us that blessed are those who have not seen me. Have not seen what Thomas has seen. Blessed are those who have seen and believed. In our United Methodist Church, this is the story that brings us our understanding, or one of them brings us our understanding of what John Wesley says when he tells us that reading scripture is a means of grace. That through reading and hearing the story, God's grace moves in us and we believe. We go from unbelief to belief. The story is the evidence. Jesus is there telling them that the story will set you free. That the story will save pray today that we read the story. That we read the story and feel the breath of God literally in our bones. That we read the story and the other stories. All the stories in our unbelief can turn into belief. Read the story and maybe you can answer that question we had before Easter from the hymn that said, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree. And if you read the story, Jesus says, yes, you can answer yes because you were there. Thomas believed because he had seen, but you believed because of the story. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe I was there. I believe because I see the scars now. I believe because I hear the story. I believe because the story is true. That Jesus is alive. The story is my evidence. God, as we gather here to worship, sometimes we gather in unbelief and sometimes we gather in belief. We doubt and we wonder. But I pray, Lord, that we read the story. Because in the story, your spirit moves, changes our hearts, makes us whole once more. Lord, may we hear your story. I pray that we share both your story and ours of how you have claimed us, how you are the evidence of life everlasting. In your holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. As our praise team comes forward, we'll sing our closing song this morning. If you've contemplated becoming a part of our church, you don't have to make any special preparations. Sometimes people do, some don't. But if you want to, we, uh, we'd love to have as many members of our church as we can.
But I also say that we would just love to have you participate, to be here in ministry with us. But if you'd like to join today, this is our time where you're invited. You're invited to come and join by profession of faith or through transfer of membership. You're also invited to come if you have something you'd like to share with Brother Jamie or I and ask for our prayers or pray for you or with you. This is your time. If you need us at this moment, please know that you are invited.
until Jesus comes again. Go now this morning. Not knowing that you came, not just knowing that you came to church this morning, but knowing that you will leave here to be God's church. 